really thrilled to welcome Rachel Breen, Amy Meisner, Celia Pym, and Winnie Van Der Rijn. Um, I'm going to give a quick bio on each of them, and then they're going to talk about themselves. So uh, hold on a second. We're still admitting. Okay. Using the stitch of an unthreaded sewing machine as a symbol of human interdependence, Rachel Breen employs the acts of sewing and dismantling to create projects and spaces for cultivating deeper understandings of labor rights and solidarity. Amy Meissner mends found textiles to address inextricably linked dualities that draw attention to inequalities in the world, useful and useless, beauty and ugliness, discarded and valued, as the act of repair becomes a means to fortify the abandoned and the vulnerable. Damage in a garment is the echo of the physicality of the body. In exploring the clothing she mends, Celia Pym builds on what is left behind and already exists, anchoring threads and yarn into the robust and healthy, filling in or reinforcing what is weak to explore what is on the insides of the clothing we wear. And asking the question, how much trouble can I make with my needle and thread? Winnie Van Der Rijn reacts to the speeding up of the world by slowing down, working with her hands in an attempt to balance the universe as she dismantles and domesticates the patriarchy one shirt at a time. So I wanna say welcome to the artists. I'm going to be spotlighting you. So you are all we're going to see when we're screen sharing and we're gonna begin um, the presentations with Winnie Van Der Rijn. So welcome Winnie and thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Tracy. Here we go. I'm gonna screen share, wish me luck. Okay, here we go. How to play well with others. So first I have to tell you, I have to admit, I'm a little starstruck to be on this panel, so I'm quite nervous. <laughs> so wish me luck. How to play well with others. Do what you can with what you have where you are. This quote guides my art practice. I'm gonna start with a little background. I am an artist of opportunity. That means that I work with what is available to me at any given time. I collect materials, acquire and experiment with techniques and pursue my curiosities. I'm an artist of second chances, preferring materials that are broken and used with the patina of age. Every time I work with repurposed materials, I have a choice to repair or reimagine. I'm a nose to tail artist committed to using all of the scrap I generate. I was a jewelry designer for about 28 years. I'm an omni crafter and I'm a lifelong learner. I've taken innumerable classes, um, including basket weaving, wire weaving, mixed media sculpture, altar making, metal smithing, print making, exploding picture boxes, wood carving, Marxist theory, sculpture, book binding, cold connections, precious metal clay, hat making, shoe making, weaving, machine knitting, sashiko stitching, screen printing, dyeing techniques, hand stitch bloomers, world embroidery, and feminist theory, to name a few. I am wildly curious about how things are made. I'm interested in identity, gender, power, beauty, and community. I'm curious about revolution and patriotism and reenactment. It seems I'm constantly trying to reconcile my deeply feminist outlook and leftist Berkeley education with my military upbringing. I want my work to be intentional, purposeful, and ambitious. In the fall of 2018, I started a deep dive into textiles through a nine-month residency at the Textile Arts Center in Brooklyn. In the studio, there's a poster with the quote, the role of the artist is to make the revolution irresistible. And I walked by it every day. And I started to think, I want to be a revolutionary. I can be a revolutionary. I will be a revolutionary. I am a revolutionary but I wanna make the revolution both irresistible and accessible. So I work with very small commonplace tools and ubiquitous materials and skills that anyone can learn. I'm gonna give you a peek at my creative practice and illustrate the evolution of my social practice through three projects. Every project starts with the question, what if and why not? Project number one, how to start a revolution. At the beginning of my textile arts residency, I visited a Warhol show at the Whitney Museum. I was struck by two things, the multiple portraits of Chairman Mao and Warhol's interest in drag. 
At the time, my practice included embroidering drag makeup onto contemporary images. As I started to research Sherman Mao, I came upon the quote, a revolution is not a dinner party or writing an essay or painting a picture or doing embroidery. It cannot be so refined, so leisurely and gentle, so temperate, kind, courteous, restrained and magnanimous. A revolution is an insurrection, an act of violence by which one class overthrows another. And I'll admit it, I felt like Mao was calling me out and I'm a bit reactionary. Oops, I missed a slide. I'm a bit reactionary. So I thought, all right, Chairman Mao, challenge accepted. My first step was obvious. I embroidered a little red book with the aforementioned quote and an iconic image of Mao in a variety of makeup inspired by the colors of the Warhol portraits. But I was still itchy because I simply disagreed. I think a revolution is a dinner party or rather a dinner party can be a revolution. The only way to start a revolution is through community. A community is often built by sharing food. I convinced Tian Tian, a young woman in my residency cohort to collaborate with me. And we developed through lots of trial and error, a template for a revolutionary dinner party. And then we activated our project by hosting a revolutionary dinner party where participants designed their own revolutions and then shared their ideas. Revolutions, as you might imagine, are not one size fits all. Much of my work follows this pattern, idea, object creation, activation, and then resulting artifact. Project two, how to dismantle the patriarchy. How to dismantle the patriarchy is a years long project that I started during my TAC residency and completed last summer. I showed the entire body of work in a pop-up museum of my own creation, the Museum of Natural Consequences. It is an examination and deconstruction of the power in menswear. This project was triggered by three things. One, the drastic increase in false news. If others could make up a story and create a false narrative, so could I. Two, a daughter graduating college, feeling like I hadn't done enough, like we feminists hadn't changed the world and she wasn't going to be safe. Three, menopausal rage. I don't know if you've noticed, but one of the side effects of menopause is invisibility. As I was enjoying menopause, people suddenly started calling me sir. I felt the world was trying to unwoman me. And I wondered, was I now man with access to the power of man? If so, what might I do with that power? I had been deemed spent, invisible and innocuous. Hmm, how could I use that to my advantage? So I decided that I would usurp the power and tear the whole patriarchal system down. I would question the legitimacy, amplify the absurdity and offer alternatives. I conducted an artistic, but completely junk science examination in the power in menswear. I started with the question, what if everyone had access to power? I pushed forward my narrative that the power was in the clothes, specifically the seams as they hold all the energy and labor of the making. Then I stripped the power away through an iterative intervention, thereby dismantling the patriarchy one shirt at a time. My intention was to find the vestiges of power, extract it and reimagine it, reform it and redistribute it. To do this, I leaned on my traditionally female, very domestic skills of sewing, weaving and embroidery, submersive stitching, subversive stitching as an act of rebellion. I've created an army of a hundred shirts. Patriarchy is power structure that can and must be dismantled. As long as we ignore or passively accept the patriarchal structure, there can be no real or lasting change and no true equality. We must keep ideas of change in the conversation or it won't happen. By approaching this project with some humor and a bit of absurdity, I hope to spark engagement in this deeply serious subject. The work I'm showing in Mining Mending is from this project. The Lending Library of Power in particular is an opportunity for people to try on the power that has been extracted from the patriarchal uniform. Project three, the Gossip Project, how to create community. The world has become very extreme and I had this radical idea. I thought, what if we started with kindness? What if we were kind to each other? I had a crazy idea that if we talk to people about what we have in common, 
we could build the trust necessary to show vulnerability and talk about the things we don't have in common, perhaps a chance to move towards civil discourse. The Gossip Project started as proof of concept while I was an artist in residence at Chateau Orcavo in France last October. I invited each artist in the cohort to sit with me and talk. We wore matching lipstick and drank staining beverages, coffee, tea, or red wine, with the goal of staining the vintage napkins I had collected. And we would talk about anything and everything. Then I would randomly choose a few sentences or phrases from each conversation and write them down. Then I took all of the excerpts and made a writing. The phrases out of context read like gossip. Next, I embellished the stains on the napkins with embroidery. It's performance plus community participation plus conversation plus selective editing plus embellished lipstick monoprints on vintage napkins. This is still a work in progress and its final form is to be decided. I hope to continue this project with different populations all around the country. I am far less interested in what I can make myself than what we can make together. I think the best art is collaborative and participatory. I think that collaboration is its own art form. It's a mindset change from you and me to us and we. Every decision I make about how I spend my time and money tells the world who I am and what I value. Every time we pick up a needle, every time we mend and stitch, we're fighting consumption and fast fashion and climate change. Stitching is a form of resistance to a world that seems to continuously speed up without pause or consideration. Working with our hands is an act of rebellion. The question isn't who is going to let me, the question is who is going to stop me. Do what you can with what you have where you are. Welcome to the revolution. That's it. Thank you, Winnie. Woo! And I'm just going to throw in there that we hope at some time in the future to bring the gossip project to Textile Center, because we would love to have you. Um, next, we are going to hear from, sorry about that, Amy, Amy Meissner. That's all right. Um, so go, go ahead, ahead and screen share my screen. Ready. Okay, Oops, great. So my name is Amy Meisner. I'm an artist with a craft-based practice. For 23 years, I've worked and lived as an uninvited guest on Denaina Echnena in Degayakak, a place currently referred to as Anchorage, Alaska. This lies within the circumpolar north, a fragile environment where I'm privileged to raise two children and where the practice of making, repair, reuse, and long-term keeping has a history that's thousands of years old. My own history is also long. I'm the 12th firstborn daughter to a firstborn daughter, a matriarchal lineage beginning in 1640s Sweden. This photograph features four generations of those firstborn daughters. I am the youngest and the last. My son broke the line, perhaps luckily, before someone became the 13th firstborn daughter to a firstborn daughter. Although I was raised in the US, this is still the landscape of memory I stand on. Women who have mothers, women who have children, in all its messiness and misunderstandings and misremembering, this groundwork is as deep as it is wide. The remnant of their craft is the handwork of accretion, the filling in of embroidery, the incremental growth of crochet and weaving, the structuring and restructuring of clothing, the relentlessness of mending. In response to these artifacts, my studio practice combines traditional handwork, found objects, and abandoned textiles to reference the literal, physical, and emotional work of women. This repairing, remaking, and manipulation of discarded household cloth is not only a cultural nod to the handwork created by generations of Scandinavian women in my family, but a space to confront societal disregard of women's textile and garment work, both historic and contemporary. This family of repairers, thousands of miles away, 
maintained a mindset for reconfiguration that transferred to me. In the 1970s California home I grew up in, we recycled everything. We just didn't name it that. We called it, quote, stacking jars and organizing lids for canning, or, quote, folding plastic bags and sorting by size into labeled shoe boxes, or, quote, taking a trip out to the shed with something to store for later, or to look for a thing on a certain shelf next to some other things that might do a thing, or fit on a thing, or plug a hole in a thing. We didn't throw things away because they were materials, and materials felt valuable. Within domestic spaces, the original maker's hopes for beautification, mark making, and eventual inheritance is a strong undercurrent for my work. My studio practice exists because other women's labor and emotions existed first. My social practice, which fosters a local repair culture, is community and place-based, but also intimate and individual. I approach clothing and textile repair for and with others as an act of prolonging care and accompaniment of vulnerable objects in transition. When I repair for others, I provide the option of a visible or invisible mend. Most of the time, people want their repairs to be invisible. They prefer this invisible rebuilding, but this also means the evidence of care is also sometimes invisible. For this reason, it's often difficult to trace the histories of repair in an object or community. This is an example of a craft's fineness contributing to its own erasure. Acts of Fortification 1 through 5 is my contribution to the exhibition Mining Mending. The work is in response to my girlhood embroidery lessons, which emphasize repetition and perfection. The reverse finished as finely as the front, or I ripped stitches out and began again. This tradition of teaching young women handwork skills readied them for society's expectation of womanhood and motherhood, teaching patience, domestic skills, cleanliness, silence. Completed work was intended to reflect households, selves, and potential for usefulness and beauty. Doilies are abundant vestiges of this era of handwork. Laboring bodies, crafted to bear the brunt of hard edges, to diffuse sunlight, capture oils, moisture, and dust, while ensuring the longevity of the protected surfaces below them. Despite their labor-intense construction and complex beauty, they were, in this sense, disposable. Sarah Ahmed writes that use and uselessness appear as, quote, one value system among others, such as happiness and unhappiness, beauty and ugliness, reason and sensuality. What matters is how they become attached to one another, end quote. The work Acts of Fortification 1 through 5 engages repair to become the attachment between binaries of disuse and reuse. This process of darning into decorative holes left by the original makers draws together margins of an unwanted, unused object to reconsider use value, creating weight, warmth, and visibility where this didn't exist prior. Darning enters spaces not overtly in need of repair to better understand emptiness and brokenness in this piece. The act is one of remaking, reassessing use, and overriding known and or unknown histories to fortify these abandoned vulnerable objects. Care and care work, like repair, is often invisible. It's completed off-site, after hours, in the margins. In Western culture, it has been traditionally undervalued, underpaid, and given over to perceived, quote, lower members of society, women, servants, the enslaved, working class people, people of color. But society would stop functioning without care, including its facets of maintenance and repair. My social practice places repair, the repairer, and the vulnerable object in the center while applying an ethic of care to the work. Excessively teaching others how to repair and my ongoing learning from others who either also repair or simply need repair is a vital component. Within a caregiving space, my work adheres to what I call an ethic of accompaniment. 
a relational way of caring for a vulnerable object through its transition into the next phase of being. To accompany is to share an experience, even nourish one another through or across one or many thresholds. While a repair achieves working order for an object, the act of repair provides purpose, calls on attentiveness and memory, and entails repetition and a slowing of time that can result in therapeutic or emotional repair for the repairer. To accompany is to travel parallel, sometimes guiding, sometimes following, but still caring for and repairing one another. It is also challenging. Repair is often time consuming and inefficient, so much faster to discard and replace. But the craft of repair holds a valid form of knowledge, a vital component to envisioning alternative futures. Again, I am inspired by place when considering such futures. Evidence of deep care exists in vulnerable objects from the past, such as this pair of Inupiaq snow goggles in the permanent collection of the Anchorage Museum. A vital tool for preventing photokeratitis or snow blindness, the wearer would have been pressed to repair the goggles quickly. Potentially an entire community would have relied on this repair and the wearer's successful return from a multi-day hunt. Repair and community are entwined. The historic and contemporary craft of repair in the North features adaptation, prolonging, circular methods of production and ongoing maintenance. It reveals the collapsing of time through generational learning, crafts connection between people, objects and methods across great distance, ways of belonging to a place and an ability to foster an ethical response to the broken, whether an everyday object or a climate in crisis. To engage in this craft is to consider repair rather than replacement or discarding as a first response to brokenness. It is a privilege to come to this understanding and to be reminded of it every day. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Amy. Ooh. I am really psyched to be here with you all. Oh, okay, Rachel Breen, you are up next. Hi, everyone. My name is Rachel Breen, and I'm so honored to be here. I want to thank Tracy for this really beautiful curatorial exhibition. It's, it's a stunning exhibition. As the only local artist, I've been really honored to see the work in person and see how the work relates and communicates to each other. So... I think about mending in a really metaphorical way. I have worked with a sewing machine as a drawing tool for many, many years. And so what you're looking at here as an example of one of the ways that I incorporate sewing and using of the sewing machine into my practice. So I've made stencils on an unthreaded sewing machine and I've taken soft pastel and pounced them or shaken them through holes of the stencil directly onto the wall. The shapes that you see here are shapes that I've taken from fabric scraps I collected outside of a garment factory in Bangladesh when I was there on research. And in a way, this work combines so many of my different interests, my interest in bringing attention to labor rights and particularly the labor rights of garment workers in the global south, uh, my interest in seeing how we are connected to each other. I'm interested in the pattern, the repetition of these holes and the ways that they symbolize um, the need to see human beings that are very live very, very far from us um, as, as, as people we are connected to. So I really enjoy this word, the idea of repair with, and the idea of reconnect and mend. I see these all as similar words. The, the idea of connecting materials and people really lies at the heart of how I think about my art practice. This is a larger image of the, the first detail shot that I showed you. So this is part of a very large wall drawing and really suggests that layering of fabric scraps, the buildup of piles of materials that are really the, the after thought, the negative spaces of our clothes and my hope is that people actually see these fabric scraps as connected to the clothes that we're wearing today. 
So Shroud is uh, a lot of, together. Really a lot of people need some tips and tricks to how to stay hydrated, especially in the summer. But Did you call me? Yeah. Could, could everyone please mute with the exception yeah. of the presenters? Thank you. Shroud is a piece that I made um, really to show the ways that garment workers have been exploited across time and throughout history and across geographic borders. This, uh, these shirts represent the number of people who died in the Rana Plaza factory collapse and the Triangle Shirtwaist factory fire combined. And these are all used shirts that were purchased at the Goodwill outlet by the pound. And that's a really important piece of my work in that the materials themselves have meaning and history and show that we are all connected to the ways of that garment workers are treated, the ways that uh, we consume our clothing, the ways that we dispose of it is not uh, separate from the ways that uh, the workers are treated. My social practice is very connected to having conversations. When I was in Bangladesh and realized that the women who are making our clothes would never wear the clothes that they're making, I found that very ironic. And so I started a project called the Garment Solidarity Project where I sew clothing for the garment workers in Bangladesh. Now I'm not actually sewing clothes for them. They would never want anything that I would make, but it is a gesture and, and a way to have a conversation with public here in the United States. So here I am um, sewing uh, a shawl wear kameez, which is a loose fitting tunic. And it's at an open streets project here in Minnesota. If you have a sewing machine out in public, people want to come see what you're doing. It's just so unusual. And there's so much nostalgia people have connected and related to the idea of the sewing machine. And it gives me an opportunity to explain what I'm doing and why. And people surprisingly are always curious and want to have a conversation. And these conversations are really the product of this work. It's the, that is what comes grows out of, of this work and is, is really important to me. This project and unmaking uh, was something that I did, uh, you can see during the pandemic, I had a big exhibition at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts and could not do any programming at the museum. So I invited my neighbors to engage in a project where we all unmade together. So everyone brought a used shirt. I taught them how to use a seam ripper. We sat for an hour and took apart seams. And then we had a conversation about it. And it was really pretty amazing to see what kinds of insights people had looking at the parts of the shirt. Uh, some people felt guilty for having taken apart somebody else's work. Uh, people had some appreciation and realization of how complicated these garments are. And also somebody was very interesting, wondered why were we taking something apart when it could be used, reused? And I, I was surprised at how people didn't realize how much waste there is at the our, all of our used clothing stores, the Goodwills, the Salvation Armies, uh, only 20% of it is, is able to be reused and much of it ends up being uh, shipped over to Africa or South America and put in landfills there. And so it was a, a great way to have a conversation about how we are using and consuming the clothes that we wear and, and what should we do with, with what we're disposing of. This is the piece that I have at the Textile Center. And it was a, an opportunity for me to branch out in, in some of the ways that I am thinking about social change and the connection to textiles and the stitch and, and labor rights. This piece is called Yearning for Whole, Mending the World. Um, it, the title actually comes from a Hebrew um, saying, tikkun olam, which means repair of the world. An important part of my identity is being Jewish, and that really um, fuels a lot of the ways that I see um, sewing and um, and the role of the artist in society. And I'm just going to give you a, a detail shot uh, so you can see, again, the mark of the stitch and even some hand drawing that I've done on this piece. Uh, again, the stencils come from an unthreaded sewing machine. So the mark of the stitch is a part of the, the line that you see here. And when I talk about yearning for whole, that the drawing itself is made up of paths of a whole that are yearning to be whole. And just go back so that you can see that shot here. I'm 
recently just feeling this sense of yearning for for social justice, um, hoping for change, and at times feeling less hopeful. And this was kind of a mediation on that desire to see um, to see less fragmentation, less brokenness, and less connection, and um, and a and a way and kind of an expression of of that desire. And I'll leave you with that. Rachel, thank you so much. Um, Celia Pym is going to um, round out the presentations, and then we'll have some uh, discussion and Q&A. Great. Take it away. Thanks. Uh, play from start. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, massive thank you to the other speakers. This is always the trouble with going last. My head's full of the thoughts that have just come before me. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, I have to talk about my own work. Um, and thank you, of course, to Textile Centre for organising this and to all of you for coming. I know I'm from I'm in London. I always like to situate myself on Zoom um, and it's a really hot evening here and perhaps it's hot with you. So I hope I have a really tight 10 minutes. I have a tendency to go on sometimes. I'm going to set my clock. Bear with me for one second. Here we go. So I've called this talk on mending stories of damage and repair. As Tracy said, my name is Celia Pym. Um, this is actually the title of a book I just wrote. And really the thinking behind the book is what I have learned from mending people's clothes over the last um, 17 odd years. And I should say, so this is the, um, the jumper that got it all started for me. I should explain in my own work, I often think that I'm just pursuing a curiosity. I don't have a strategic plan. I'm not thinking, right, mending, this is going to be the work I'm going to do <laughs> for the next 17 years. In fact, it sort of caught me by surprise. I kind of thought it would fizzle out, if I'm honest. And, um, and yet I keep seeing new nuances in it. So this sweater. This sweater is called Roly Sweater. It belonged to my great uncle and it was made by my great aunt. Some of you in the room I know will have heard me talk about this before. My uncle had just died. I'd moved uh, and in 2007 and my dad gave me this sweater that belonged to him. His sister who had made the sweater had died about eight years earlier. Um, my dad gave it to me, I think, in that act of clearing out homes after someone's no longer alive. You're not quite sure what to do sometimes with the more personal items. And yet this broken or this damaged sweater sort of sat in between. It was like, well, who's going to make use of a, a, a sweater full of holes? And yet it seemed too personal to get rid of. So when he gave it to me, he was right. I was thrilled by it because there were these massive holes in the forearms. I was studying textiles at the time. I was doing my master's in textiles. And it wasn't that I actually had any thoughts about mending, but I saw this sweater and instantly it evoked a very particular picture of him because my uncle was a painter. And at the end of his life, when he was 96, 95, 96, he would sit every day in an armchair with a drawing board across his chair and he would draw, he would draw every day. Uh, he'd break for lunch, have an egg, and then sit back down again and draw some more. And when I saw these holes in the forearms, it conjured that picture of him with his particular body movements and the particularness of the way he spent his time. Then I looked a little bit more closely at the sweater and I found all these patches of white repair. The sweater's kind of cream, but the white repair was all done by his sister, Elizabeth who had actually been a very significant carer in my life. I'd lived with her when I was younger. And that hit me. I was like, oh, yes, I remember that very practical everyday care. I mean, some of the other speakers have already spoken about it and resonated with me, the kind of relentlessness of the care that women in our lives have sometimes shared us. That was a word Amy used. 
So I went to the library and I looked up mending in a book. I'd never done it before. I'd never done before, even though I'd seen it done by others. And I mended his sweater in blue um, to look different from her stitches. And I would say these twin things that a garment holds a trace of the person that wore it, literally their physical movement and action. And the work of darning as a small act of care has what is what's kept me curious in my work. To date, this is still the most damaged thing I've ever mended. This is called the Norwegian sweater. I need to go a bit quicker. This sweater is made was from Anamor Sundberg's rag pile. This is Anamor sitting atop her rag pile. Anamor is a Norwegian textile artist. She's just been given a National Treasure Award, so you should check her out. Um, and she ran a shoddy factory in southwest Norway for about 20 years in the 80s and 90s. So a shoddy factory very quickly is a factory or a machinery that shreds textiles and out the other side comes a kind of fluff that you can recycle. Um, and she, with her shoddy machines, she was, people would donate by weight, a bit like Rachel were talking about, about waste and weight of waste. They'd donate her this uh, cloth and clothing. She would feed it through the machine and make blankets and insulating fiber. And she was very practical about this, but she started to observe garments that she thought they were handmade. And she thought they told a very particular story of the pattern making of her region. So she started to save them without a big plan. And what happened was she amassed a one ton collection of secondhand hand knit knitwear, all from this region of Norway, of which this particular piece came from. I mended it in white. I think she gave it to me as a bit of a challenge. I'd gone to see her and I said, oh, I'm trying to become an expert in holes. I was very young. This was 2009. Not very young, but I was young in the mending journey. And um, she gave it to me and it took me probably four months to mend. The way I mend is extremely slow. I do it all by hand with a needle and thread and my arm slipped inside the arm of the garment. This word has come up already in the talk, intimacy. I think it's incredibly intimate work to mend someone else's clothing. And in this instance, I didn't know anything about the owner. So as I have my hand inside the sleeve or the body, I'm looking for clues or I'm the slowness forces me to look for clues or hints about the person who might have owned it or made it. It's definitely a handmade sweater. I chose white because... I picked it out of the pattern, but also I really love one of the things I think about that damage and repair go hand in hand. Um, and I always want to see what is missing. I want to see the damage. The damage is the life of the thing. So I'm really keen in my attitude to mending. And this wasn't fully formed as an idea then. But as I've gone on to understand it is that I'm interested in that layering of mending and making that layering and the repair and the mending visible. And actually I think of mending as slightly different from repair because I think that mending isn't, to me, the word isn't quite as practical as repair. Mending is this sort of um, work of adding to the thing. So you're not, you're not taking it apart and putting it back together again. You're adding an additional layer on top of it. This is a slightly different story. I don't normally talk about this. This is a dress that used to belong to the film actress, Vivian Lee. I did this, I finished this job in, or this piece of work in 2019. What was interesting for me about this piece of work is I didn't, it came to me from a film director, James Ivory. He sent it to me. He'd found it in his attic very quickly. He'd found it in his attic during the pandemic and been horrified by how much damage, how much moth damage had occurred in it. He also was reflecting on um, people he, who were no longer in his life. So he used to share the house with Ismail, who was his partner and uh, producing partner, and one of his, the woman he, writer he worked with a lot, Ruth Jabvala and her husband, and they are all no longer alive. So he was sort of reassessing the things in his house. And I would say much of my work draws on that space of people's homes. Anyway, he finds this dress, can't believe it's that damaged, through a network, a series of networks, including my dad, the dress ends up with me again. Um, uh, and this actually sat around in the studio for almost, just gonna check my time, almost two and a half years before I decided what to do with it. Part of my difficulty was, is I couldn't figure out 
like I could see the damage. I could think about how I was going to repair it. Um, but I couldn't, I didn't have a relationship with the thing. <laughs> and often this happens a lot. These damaged things sit in my studio for a long, long time, years waiting to be mended. I started to handle the cloth quite a lot. I tried to research her. I'd never really seen her movies. The emphasis for him, she left it with him to return. They encountered each other in India. She was He was going to return it to her. She passed away. It ended up in their attic. 60 years later, it ended up with me. I started to feel the fabric because I kept holding it thinking, well, what thread would be good? What's the, what's the feeling of this? And what I discovered as I looked in the inside is that it's um it's a wool silk blend made by this company, the women home industry. And that was my entry into this because suddenly I realized this was a hand knit piece of um, clothing. And then I could imagine the labor of making labors come up a couple of times, but the weight of the fabric, the quality of this fabric got me curious in who had made it. And so it wasn't so much about who had owned it, though that gives it a bit of glamour, but it was much more about who had made it. So I looked up women's home industry and that's um, the reason I mention it is because I never know what the particular story for this thing is going to be. And it turns out it was a fashion brand that started in 1947 post-war to um, galvanize a knitting workforce in the UK, particularly women, to be able to generate um, piecework from home. So they I went and I discovered that the archive is held at London College of Fashion. This is one of the books for making the patterns. Um, there was a clipping that said when they did their first call out for knitters, this company, they um, got 30,000 responses. I just love the idea that the UK used to have 30,000 skilled enough knitters to do this work. I mean, it was a massive entry point for me. Um, this would this would be how your pattern would appear. These were the test books. You'd get a little swatch, you'd get the instructions and you'd knit up your piece of work. I mended the dress. It's mended in a white cashmere um, wool. Uh, but the real exciting jumping off point for me was discovering this archive, which I think and suspect will inform future work. The final story, and forgive me, I have overrun a tiny bit, um, is this sweater. So this is much more personal. This is Bill's sweater. Again, it's moth damage. And I would say that um, I have, am starting to develop a positive relationship with moths, to think of them as collaborators. But the reason I mentioned this sweater, here is Bill wearing his sweater. When I went to ask, I was doing a, I'd been invited to put some work into an exhibition for the Women's Hour Craft Prize. And what I decided to make for this project was I wanted to mend things belonging to healthcare professionals, people who do the care work in the most obvious care work in our community uh, and particularly caring for body and mind. And so I approached Bill, who was a doctor, a retired doctor. He really had nothing to give me. I went, I hung out for almost four hours. I thought, never mind. Um, because I have to say, tracking down the things is half my work. Uh, I thought, this isn't going anywhere. I'm leaving. I mean, we had a really nice day. And as I was at the door, as they say in lots of encounters, the important stuff always gets said at the moment that you're leaving. He invited me upstairs, pulled open the drawer of his dresser, and in it were all were five hand-knit sweater vests in the most amazing colours, lilacs, oranges, purples, terribly moth-eaten. And he started crying a little bit. He pulled out the orange sweater. We laid it on the bed and he said, this was knit by Ursie, who was his wife, who I had also known, who had died almost 12 years earlier. And suddenly he and I were talking about her and we hadn't yet had an opportunity to do that in the day or it hadn't, we hadn't found our way into it. And one of the things that I find with this mending practice is that by looking at and touching, holding a physical thing, it opens up conversations in ways that if you just ask directly, it doesn't. And what he said was, Ursi was such a skilled knitter, she could knit the shape of me without even measuring me. She knew the shape of me in her fingers. And I was incredibly moved by that bodily 
in that knowledge that was in her. And I would hold her up as a role model from my life, my legacy or my mentors are all those women I've known who knit and mended and made. I mended it in yellow with his permission and then returned for this portrait. The sweaters actually got lost. Bill died in uh, 2022 and the sweater disappeared at the nursing home somewhere. So I have a fantasy that someone else is wearing it and telling a story saying that it's their, their sweater now. Anyway, thank you very much for listening. I apologise to the others for running over. Winnie. Rachel, Amy, Celia, thank you all so much. My head's kind of swimming. Um, I am going to turn it over to you guys first to see if you have any questions for each other now that you've heard each other's presentation. I mean, I just, I'm sort of reeling, you know, every, I questions for all of you. It was so wonderful to end on this very sort of heartfelt Celia your um heartfelt presentation so um I'm going to turn it over and see if any of you have questions for each other before we take questions from the audience yeah go dive right well, in I I have less of a question but just a comment I'm um I'm really inspired by seeing how all of us are so connected to materials. And it's mm -hmm. really fascinating to me how, what, what textiles do for us, what mate this material does for us. And, uh, you know, I, I think all of us would probably know that textiles are having a moment in the, the art world. Um, but aside from that, I, I you know, I just want to kind of open, see what thoughts you have about like, what is it about textiles that, it, it's 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 so visceral it's primal it is a material that we find so inspiring and is such a kind of creative territory for us mm -hmm. and so for me it's just exciting to see how we're thinking about and working with these materials in such rich ways mm -hmm. well I have two I mean I think that's a lovely comment Rachel if it's okay I'll just jump in cut me off whenever anyone um I have two thoughts about that one is about softness and the quality of softness in, it's not always true, but I think that that is, can be a quality in textiles. It's flexible, it moves. Um, and with clothing, I think that that softness or that flexibility means that the clothing can change shape according to the person. So it literally is transformed by the wearer. And so the response, the gut response or the visceral response is that is because we recognize it's like a skin, you know, we recognize it um, sensorially, we recognize it in our own touch and body. And so it's, it's really powerful for that reason. But I also think the floppiness of it. So when it's off the, I'm thinking about clothing, but when it's off the body or it's floppy, I think there's something really exciting about that. I really love it. It's like, um, it's sort of more ambiguous because it sometimes it moves, right? Slips around and moves. So that's my thoughts about, uh, at the moment, about, you know, the power of textiles to communicate. Celia, I, I agree with you. And I'll, I'd like to add to that as well. Um, I find it also fascinating. Um, how textiles take on the shape of the body. Mm -hmm. And I have really noticed that in, in my home and my family's garments that need repair, particularly socks. Yeah. Um, I know whose socks are whose by where the holes emerge mm -hmm. and how they, how they walk and how they wear their socks. Mm -hmm. And um, I also find it fascinating the, um, this the, the the tracery and the history and the clues that are um that the textiles just hold if you're looking um so one thing happened with with a pair of socks and my daughter she all of her socks all of a sudden I think she was about eight or nine they were all wearing in a really funny place like up above the heel kind of like at the Achilles heel. And I thought, oh, your snow boots are probably rubbing or there's something going on. 
But what had actually happened is that she had grown and her, so her heel was actually way up above where the, the curve of the, the heel in the sock was, but yeah. we didn't realize that her foot had grown. <laughs> so she was wearing through her socks. But I think there's that, um, that attentiveness mm-hmm. that when you, when you repair a garment in particular, when you repair anything, you have to be, and you know, there's, there's this sort of list of, of ethics of care. And one of them is attentiveness and um, to really pay attention to what kind of care that textile needs, but, but also what kind of care the wearer needs as well. She needed new socks. (laughs) We needed to abandon these and start over. (laughs) I'm also really interested that, um, you know, textiles have been around forever. And I don't know how many years ago I was in Norway and I saw on um, this Viking ship, all the things they needed, the necessities. And one of the things was a loom. Mm -hmm. And the loom is literally the same loom (laughs) that is now used. Like they, they, it, it hasn't changed. It does the job. And I'm so interested in how the world is spinning so fast. And my um, husband works in tech and I feel like we do the same thing because he one zero one zero one zero. You know, he's programming. It's a binary system. I'm stitching up, down, up, down, or weaving back and forth, back and forth. And it's kind of like it all comes down to this this same thing, and they are connected. And one has been around forever mm-hmm. and continues. And it's just that that's really interesting to me as well. Mm-hmm. And I would just add um, kind of another layer to this conversation is the idea of pattern and design, which is something that I'm increasingly interested in, in how these designs and patterns actually communicate uh, and and can actually be a kind of iconography and symbolism in and of itself. And I'm really thinking about that as visual language and how these, what these designs communicate. Some of it can be about identity or culture or geography or even certain colors. We all know that certain dyes have certain colors and so it can be very regional. And I'm really interested in how these designs speak to us and also how sometimes the lack of connection to these designs also communicate. For instance, um, I've just returned from a Fulbright in India and I'm made, it has made me very cognizant of so many of the patterns of fabric that we see here in the United States and how limited they are and how much they um, are unexpressive or or not beautiful. Um, And and what a shame that is that we kind of allow ourselves to settle for clothing that is is so limited in its design and and kind of expressiveness. Mm. I mean, there's I think pattern we we haven't really I feel like there's a pattern from the there's so many pattern pleas there's like Amy's I love that story about the socks and thinking that that's a pattern to observe and be attentive to but say what you're describing a little bit Rachel it reminds me of like um fair isle knitting patterns or or one of the things that Anna Moore has written about in her book is sort of knitting patterns that recognize your group or your family so you know textiles you would wear a yoke that indicated who you were related to (laughs) because and in Shetland I think I'm sure there's people in the room who might know it better but it was because if you fell overboard and your body washed up the sweater would be what identified you so you know that that function of textiles to indicate something that, that it served a purpose more previously more than the decorative way you know differently rather than the way that we decorate ourselves now the way we decorate ourselves now I I think of them as acts of wearing we're we're making a choice of how to present or how an idea of how we see ourselves or how we want to be perceived and we put on you know like an armor like an accessory you know and and we put on this skin and Mm -hmm. we become what we decide. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like this first step to present to the world. Mm -hmm. And we have the opportunity in an act of wearing to show the world something that might be a, a 
more a private or homegrown or personal um, idea or stance about something. And then this is the public presentation of, of who I am in this act of wearing. I want to throw out a couple of thoughts that I've had, I, and I'm thinking about you guys as makers, and I'm saying that Winnie and Rachel use industrially made garments in their work. And I think I can say that Amy and Celia probably tend to focus their practice on handmade garments. So I don't know, uh, you know, I'm not sure what you have to say about that, but I think that that's something that interests me in terms of making comparisons about your work. Mm. Um, you know, it's, it's amazing to me, your work all feels very different, but there's so much of how you talk about it that feels very similar. And another thing that is on my mind too, is I'm thinking about it in terms of creative practice. And I think of all of you as artists, you're exhibiting in this show at Textile Center um, currently. H how do you choose what, what becomes your finished artwork? You know, because Amy, you were talking about this, mending your, the, the revelations you had, mending your daughter's socks, but that's not, the work that makes it into your studio practice, you know, so I'm really interested. You have so many, you all have different ways of thinking about how you mend. How does, how does, how you think about all of this end up informing the work that you present in the end? So that's kind of just an obtuse question, but throwing it out there. And then someone else asked, um, maybe you can tie it into that. Uh, have you all been practicing since you were young? You know, do, when did this um, when did this uh, conversation with mending begin as part of your practice? And I know Rachel and Winnie, you talked a little bit about this before we all went live, which I found was really fascinating. So I'm just throwing all that out there for fodder. If anybody has a response. Well, with regards to the socks, Celia already did an installation with mended socks, so I couldn't do that. <laughs> I'm kidding, but it's, um, I think that, I think there's, they're separate and yet they're, they're in, informing one another. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always looking for an entry point into, um, I guess I wouldn't even call them historic textiles, what I would call vulnerable, um, or elderly textiles, <laughs> um, that come my way all the time. <laughs> They're always coming my way. And um, I don't have the stories. I don't know why they wore in a certain place or why they were damaged. Or um, I can inf make inferences. I can guess the sun damaged this or candle wax damaged this or, you know, the sort of everyday domestic um, wear and tear of linens that were used in the home but I don't really know. And, and the thing that interests me even more is I know nothing about the woman who made it in the first place. And so a lot of times that curiosity and that questioning is the entry point for me um, as to what will become either a, a body of work or a, a singular piece of work. Um, and I think that as someone who has been sewing literally my entire life. I think I learned how to embroider when I was about two. And, and then I was in the garment industry for 12 years. I made custom-made wedding gowns for nine of those years. And that's a really intimate work, like working with the body and, you know, making a half naked woman feel comfortable in the fitting room while you're, you know, up, up in her chest trying to, to fit a corset to her um is really intimate work and there are a lot of stories that get shared during during that sort of dressmaking garment making time um i have also done production sewing where there are no stories there's zero stories there's just production and so i know i know why i don't do either of those things anymore um and why i do the things i do now but it all it all still informs what I put out into the world and the questions that I have. And um, 
about producing, about making, about overproduction. If anybody has any questions about the overproduction of clothing, just Google the Atacama Desert. I mean, that's all you have to do and your mind will be blown. So um, I think we all have responsibilities in terms of what we put out into the world as artists and craftspeople or makers, artisans, um, whatever you you feel comfortable calling yourself. Um, but the, the place where I've landed in terms of social practice is repair because it is it is not producing more, it's prolonging and it is a very hopeful act. And I think people, people who come to it with very, very few skills and very meager materials and tools can still accomplish um, a hopeful act. And I think that it gives them great joy. anyone else want to jump on that topic or have a I'll go I'll go segue so yeah I've also I've been um stitching and sewing and embroidering a long time not since I was two <laughs> but for a very long time you know I was a crafty kid when I was in I know uh my first textile I made when I was in elementary school um there was an option with a um a book report or you could do a craft associated. <laughs> it was like all about the craft. So I applied it's strawberry ice cream sundae. And I actually still have this piece. You will not see it in my studio today. But I look at it and I'm like, you know, I really like those rudimentary stitches. And it's very, thank God I could spend my time doing um doing that uh handwork. Um and now I forgot the other part of the question. <laughs> So, so I've been working for a really long time in embroidery. Oh, what's the practice? So it's, it's kind of interesting because as a maker, a crafter, an artist, I feel like my whole life is filled with art and there's what happens in the studio and what happens outside of the studio. You know, I, I consider when I'm cooking that that's art. When I invite 40 people over to eat soup, that's social practice. When I, you know, it all kind of blends together. But for me in my studio practice, it's when I have an idea that one version won't do. For me, it's iteration. I have to make five of those because I have five different ways I could make it. Oh no, now five's 10. Oh no, now I have to, it, it, I just, um, it's something that, uh, not repetition, but iteration that draws me in, in the studio, um, practice. And then for the social practice, it's both, I really play well with others. I really like to collaborate. I really like the conversation and the thing that can only happen when more than one person is um, present. And at the same time, not only collaboration, but then involving others, even just if they have a comment about or a question about or a suggestion for or any kind of interaction um, feeds my, my social practice and it can happen. It's, it's pretty fluid, but it's definitely when I have an idea that I need to do multiples of that it hits the, the studio zone, the studio practice zone. Such nice answers. Rachel, you wanted to say something, go ahead. Okay. Um, I learned how to embroider when I was in sixth grade in a sixth grade art class. I had a very forward thinking art teacher and also took sewing lessons and learned how to sew. Um, when I think about what what work to show, uh, you know, I, I'm always excited when somebody was going to allow me to make work on their wall. So when Tracy said, well, do you want to do a wall drawing? I was like, yes. Um, because that opportunity doesn't come that often. The wall's going to have to be repainted and all that. And so that's always an option, an opportunity for me to do something new and branch out. And I think as artists, it's always a real tricky balance of making something that we think that we've done that people have liked versus branching out and making something new. Um, I also, my work is very research-based and my travels have allowed me to meet people on the other side of the earth. And I often feel a sense of responsibility. I've had these opportunities. And so I want to platform ideas that are connected to these people. And so, and, and the challenges that especially workers face that we often don't see here in the U.S. And so 
thinking about that and how to represent those stories in my work, um, but but um, but not make the work documentary like, um, but make it artistic and uh, you know not literal. Is is like these are the things that I kind of juggle as I'm thinking about work. I'm always really grateful for opportunities to do something new and take risks. And it's also sometimes really hard to do that because it's a risk. It might not be great. And so, you know, th those opportunities are uh, don't come often. And so I appreciate that, Tracy, that, that I've been able to do that in this particular show. That's really nice. Well, I guess my answer is I can't remember when I started to sew. I can distinctly remember a cross stitch of a fox at night that I made <laughs> when I was nine years old, but I was definitely sewing. It was quite sophisticated. I think it, I must have been sewing for a while before that. So it's been most of my life. I think everything everyone's saying about this um, sort of active, this work that is directly with people and then how you represent that in the gallery is always quite an interesting challenge. Um, I think it also is about the structures of what the gallery looks like. Like, you know, I loved your piece, um, Rachel, on the street. And when you made that comment about the sewing machines, quite an attractive object, it is really interesting to me how if you pitch up with some needles and thread, it's not very difficult to get people, curious people to come have a go. And often the conversation is quite quickly, oh, I knew someone who did this or you, they talk about a relative they remember. I mean, if you've got a darning mushroom, you're off. Everyone wants to tell you about <laughs> the darning mushroom they remember from another period in their life um for me I would say um it's constantly back and forth between objects and a sort of live event-based work um one of the challenges I've been working on is that the if I'm mending something that belongs to someone it gets returned to them so how do I so so it is a bit with photography as well um how the the things are recorded and then I think a lot about these sort of, if you if you're a mending hub, as I'm not a mending hub, but I mend a lot of things that belong to other people. So they come here. How do I record what the thing is if I'm returning it to them? And actually, I'm just doing a show, and I've had to borrow back a lot of things from people, and that's been interesting because a couple of them came with fresh holes, and I was looking at them thinking yeah. I should probably remend this. But um, I try not to do my mending. I don't. I mean, this is very because I am so slow, I don't charge people for mending. I am, I, I try and, for example, Bill Sweater was funded by the museum that was commissioning the work. So I look for the commission. I mean, if you just talk nuts and bolts of how you do things, I look for the commissioner to fund a project that I then propose to other people so that, that the mend isn't a it's not a job because also I need the people to be patient with me because it takes me so long and the amount of time it takes to do the kind of repair I'm interested in is not, doesn't result in efficiency. Um, I am deeply inefficient. Anyway, but the work can take lots of forms. I have found great joy in trading mm -hmm. and trading for things that, that are skill-based. So if you, the old trope of the, you know, the 10,000 hours. So I'm, I'm providing a skill that I've, you know, worked out for 10,000 hours in, in order to be able to do this skill. So what's your skill? You know, how can we trade? Well, I don't have any skills. Well, you always, you know, somebody always has a skill. So I've received in exchange, um, salmon, fresh caught salmon, um, caribou liver, someone delivered to me someone brought a fresh baked focaccia bread of her own recipe to the front door and it was still steaming mm. um you know these are the kinds of things that um so, sort of take repair outside of of the mainstream it's still kind of existing in the margins but it's it's creating its own little economy and it's it's pushing against um the broader culture and and consumerism and um that gives me a lot of joy so I, I appreciate that I'm glad you brought that up Celia well I also think I 
someone interviewed me this morning and I think and that one of the questions they asked was like they were asking about this like basically how do you make a living <laughs> which is a, always a good question Rude. <laughs> maybe but I also think it's very relevant students always ask I think it's a really it's it's and and one and then the answer is like is that is the economy you live in the way that you want to be making a living I mean for me most of my bread and butter is teaching but uh, to think about the projects I think I do view it as a privilege when someone trusts me to mend their thing and a lot of my own work is finding the things and then and then working out what to do with it and it's hard to not sound too goody two shoes about it but I just that trust that someone has in me that I will care for that thing when it's important to them it's a bit like sickness and health the trust someone has in you when you look after them or you care for them and they let you because they have to let you because it's their body their health their themselves and I feel that a lot with mending clothing mm -hmm. yeah. We have a question in the chat that I want to address for Rachel. And let me scroll up a bit. In your work, there's such a satisfying relationship between the intimate scale of machine stitching and masses of suspended fabric. What's interesting to you, conceptually or aesthetically, about working on an almost monumental scale? That's a great question. Um, a lot of my interest in working really large is a way to point to the scale of the problems that I'm addressing. So scale is really important in that regards. Um, and the challenge is then to how to make the work still work aesthetically, right? Especially with some of the, I mentioned patterns. Um, I have a piece up right now at the M, um, the Minnesota Museum of Art, and it's polyester and which was this horrible material to work with in and so but it still had to make the patterns and colors work in an aesthetic way and and that becomes a fun part of the making process right how do I put together pieces and I'm I'm sure you all in some ways are thinking about the same thing at, at, when you're mending when you're darning you're still thinking about how does this begin to work and emerge as a design that is really interesting to look at and so it's it it becomes a puzzle that is really fun to kind of have to figure out in you know another piece that i had at the MIA at the Minneapolis Institute of Art piecework which was sleeves from many many different shirts i spent so much time arranging the different patterns and the colors and the lights and darks so that it would work, but also speak to a sense of randomness. And um, these are really fun challenges. Um, but I also want to say something. I, I appreciate that you speak about um, the intimate scale of machine stitching, because I think that's it's oftentimes I think people think of machine stitching as machine work and not handwork. This is a question that I've had. And I, I think about how somebody is still running the machine somebody is still touching the material and so it's it and and I'm curious maybe some of you have a, a response to that because I think there is something unique about handwork when there's not anything electric or powered you know and you're just working with your hand but at the same time working on a sewing machine to me is handwork and I think it's a little challenging and to we have to think carefully about how about that divide so it's an important question and um when I talk about the the symbol of the stitch, it and 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 what it means to me, it, and it is an intimate mark. I think about about it as we all have clothes that we're all wearing right now that have stitches, and it's next to our skin and every part of our body. And so, in that way, whether it's machine made or handmade, it is still intimate and it's still connected to us, and it still connects us to the people who made whatever we're wearing. Um, but I'm curious about what you all think about that kind of. Um, contradiction or not contradiction between um, hand stitching and machine stitching. I want to throw in there as well the, the, the act of cutting because we have several folks in the show who have, who cut. And Winnie, you're a, you're a cutter disassembler. And I'm going to say, I'm going to throw Mark Newport's name in there. Mark cuts his own holes mm -hmm. and then mends them. So mm -hmm. he has a complete control over 
all of the aesthetic decisions in his work. So anyway, I wanted to throw that in there too. So Rachel, I think it's really interesting. I hadn't, until you said it, thought about the machine stitching I do as handwork. And I certainly don't want to divide. And that's given me, that's really very interesting. And I accept whole what you just said. I love it. I accept it. For, for me, when I, sometimes I, since I iterate, when I come to a new project, I think to myself, what's the smallest tool I could use to change this? And so if that is a needle and thread, sometimes the smallest tool takes the longest amount of time. What would happen if I limited myself just to the seam ripper? What would happen if I only used the tiny shears? How cramped will my hand get? You know, how long, you know, not even the long shear. What if I, so every time I kind of, um, each one is a, is a different little personal challenge um, to see how much trouble I can make with the smallest possible tool. Oh, so I think you froze, Winnie, at that crucial moment. Um, <laughs> Rachel, I definitely think of machine stitch or the mach machine stitch when there is someone operating the machine as hand stitch. And I also think of it that way in knitting. If you have to run a machine, a knitting machine with your hand, it's hand knitting, even though it's employing a machine. The difference I see is portability, um, that, that a sewing needle and small scissors uh, or knitting needles versus the machine it lets you be port it lets you move more easily um that that for me that's the big difference but the hand quality of it i i think of as the same and i've worked with a lot of in the past in my former life worked with a lot of um sewers and i have been a production sewer and a sample sewer myself and God, it's such a skill. Mm. It's such a skill to be able to adjust adjust the tension and the nuances of each fabric and turning corners and easing. And it's, um, you might think you know how to sew, but until you sit down in a factory setting at an industrial machine you, and you are facing down a, a pile of, um, you know, cut garment yokes or something or collars or something, you know, it's, um, that's a whole different ball game. And then the same with cutting too. One of the first jobs that I had in the garment industry, I, I walked in as a young 22 something or, you know, however old I was. And, and the first question was, well, can you cut? And I said, of course I can cut. Like, <laughs> Who can't cut, you know, <laughs> they were referring to not only the upright cutter, you know, to cut a stack of fabric that was this thick, but also um, hand cutting for draping and, and then, you know, being able to, to hand cut everything on a mannequin and then, and drape it on a mannequin, change the pattern, you know, so there's pattern work and cutting happening at the same time. And, and now you're going to hand this off to the seamstress who's waiting for you, you know, to put this thing together and she will tell you, or he will tell you immediately if you didn't cut it well, because it won't fit together properly. So that was, um, that was a very steep learning curve. But I love hearing you talk. Forget. We forget I, that. Yeah. I was reminded that things are handmade you know, even manufactured things are handmade because someone brought me some leggings to mend. They were just their favorite pair of leggings. It was for a project I was doing last year. And um, one leg was longer than the other leg. They pieced together like a small with a medium. So one leg was, and they, the owner had never noticed, but when we lay it out, I was like, this leg is definitely <laughs> not meant to go with this leg. Um, and it was, you know, attentiveness, observation, all those things you were talking about, Amy. It was so funny. And she just loved but both of us were suddenly thinking about the person who'd put those two legs together because it would have been a person and it was human. It was an accident, you know. Or was it a subversive act? <laughs> maybe, maybe. It was definitely with Primark. So it was definitely mass produced. <laughs> we, we, unfortunately, we lost Winnie somewhere yeah. along the way. Um, I think she was having some technical difficulty. I'm going to throw out there to the audience to see if there are any last minute questions. Cause I, I feel like the 
I would love to keep the discussion going. <laughs> um, we have to be mindful of the time um, devoted to being here with us, um, with the audience. Does anyone have any um, pressing last questions that they want to get in while we still have a few minutes left on our schedule? Um, please type it into the chat. Uh, let's see. No, just lots of thanks coming in. Um, I want to, I'm going to put a couple things out there. Uh, yes. And someone just um, added this to the conversation. We are going to be leaving the mining mending exhibitions up at Textile Center. Um, I think right now through June 20th, I'm sorry, that is so wrong. July 20th, boy, June 20th, that already passed. Um, we are, Textile Center is open um, Tuesday through Saturdays. The hours are 10 to four. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna check a couple things just to make sure I have all the details correct. We will be having a couple of additional Art Speaks sessions um, as part of Mining Mending. The next one will be tomorrow. It's uh, Pika Ghosh on Kantha. The registration information for all of these, the links are on the homepage of our website. And it's I'll put it in the chat, but it's textilecentermn.org. Um, Let's see, uh, the, we're gonna be hosting another conversation at some point in July that our, um, our one of our my coordinating assistants is putting together and it will feature a number of local uh, menders, folks who are local to the Twin Cities area. Um, and uh, I, think, I think that about covers the detail. Anything you guys, I'm, anything you guys think of that I need to answer that I might be missing. Um, please do come and see the show. We try to have these conversations in uh, at least a month in advance of the end of the show, just because um, folks get interested and they want to um, come and see the work. Uh, let's see. There was a new question. Yeah, I, I don't know. Somebody threw another question in there. Thank you. And it and this is maybe a good place to end. Sent, sentimentality is a word that comes to mind. It's often a pejorative in the art world, but I think it makes some of your work so particular and interesting. Any thoughts on the word as a descriptor of your work or what you've uh, or what you're interested in? Who wants to go first? I can start. The first thing that came to mind when I saw that question was I was told in graduate school never to do anything that was sentimental. It would be ah. too emotional. And, you know, I, and, and can maybe, I interrupt you for one sec? Was that a man or a woman who told you that? It was actually a woman. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I think I was in grad school a while ago, so maybe things have changed and come full circle. I mean, it's Certainly nobody was working with the sewing machine when I was in graduate school 20 years ago. And there's a lot more art being made with, with the tools that we're all working with. So maybe things have shifted. Um, and I certainly have come to my own conclusions about, about that, but that, that, you know, I would say, and I, I don't know that I would think about my work in particular as being so sentimental, but um, I think it's a fine word. I think it's a fine thing to have your work be connected to. And I mean, I think about sentimental as being connected to emotion. And I certainly hope that our work is connected to emotions. I hope that that is something that my work evokes is an emotional response. It's needed right now in our world. I would piggyback on the back of that and just say, yeah, I think of sentiment as feeling. Um, I also love that it's got bad press. For years, I resisted it because I was like, oh, it's too it's too pink or saccharine. I don't know what the association was, but I was like, oh, please don't call it sentimental. But more recently, I've just thought, oh, that's like a hang up I've got from somewhere else. It's actually about feeling. Um, and that is the key and and sense, you know, the, the, the sensation of something, which is... When work hits me, it's usually in my body and not in my brain. So that's what I'm looking for anyway. Yeah, I think sentimentality and nostalgia is another word that um, kind of tends to rub me in the wrong way or or in a way that I'm spiraling out of too. I think that um, 
really, really trying to resist hierarchies and it's difficult. Um, but I think, you know, there's capital C craft and there's lowercase c craft and crafting and craftiness. And there's a lot of sentimentality out in the world and people are making craft and crafts that that are imbued with sentimentality and they're doing it for a reason mm -hmm. and there's a, there's a lot of it left over from different eras and I find it fascinating and I love I love embroideries little little embroidery kits and things like if I could collect like every 1970s sunset jiffy stitching mm -hmm. sewing kit like I would be so happy <laughs> something um so so pastoral and so um so silly and and ridiculous with you know some of the patterns that are I'm talking embroidery in particular of you know big headed big eyed babies and um teddy bears and and these odd odd remnants that are um, left over and unfinished often. And um, that to me is fascinating to when I receive unfinished embroideries. Um, I don't know. I think that I, I think it can be sentimentality can be wielded in a way. And that's kind of what I try to do when I work with these kinds of materials. Um, there's sort of a tempering that I try to to achieve with something that's beautiful or quaint with something that's that's terrible and and merging the two together. Mm -hmm. I find um, something that I'm that I'm continually interested in and I find quite a challenge. Sorry about my dropping off there for a minute. I have no idea what craziness happened in the Zoom world. Um, and I might I might uh, speak to this wrong, but I'm going to speak to it anyway. So while I was doing my work dismantling the patriarchy, my father passed away mm. and um, my mother gave me some of his shirts and to use in the work. And when I started to use them, it was very different because dismantling the patriarch is far different mm. than dismantling the patriarchy. And I thought, how can I? use these in a way that is healing that I'm, that I'm, you know, um, you know, that, uh, the processing grief through my hands mm -hmm. and, and so it was a very, so I was both sentimental, but also, um, like how does it change the work? How, how do I, express the feelings, but also maybe keep them in the body of work. Um, how do I collaborate with my mom? How do we use it to mourn together? How do I represent my sisters? How do we then put these back on our bodies? Um, you know, I I started wearing some of his clothes after he passed away. I started wearing his pajamas, wondering if I would dream his dreams. Mm -hmm. You know, um, he was in the military and he was um, cremated. And my job when we had to take the uniform to um, the crematorium was to remove the metals because they don't burn well. And I had been there in my youth, all the times that he'd received those medals. And here's this very personal act of clothing and kind of like, I, I couldn't give it the ceremony it had, but it was just a really interesting, like all these things and it's all about clothes and it was personal, but abstract, but universal, but sentimental. That's all mm -hmm. I got. <laughs> God, I love that Winnie, that's amazing. Really great. We got to a great place. Yeah. Just at the end there. Amazing. You guys, thank you all. Um, uh, please come and see the show up through um, near the end of July. Check the website. We do get ready to install another show. And quite often we have um, the work up for an extra day or two. But um, look for the um, virtual exhibit. And I will be in touch with each of you uh, each of you artists 
very soon in the near future. So thank you, everyone. Thank you to the audience for hanging with us. Have a terrific afternoon, a terrific evening, Celia. Thank you all the way from um, London and Amy all the way from Alaska, just embarking on your day. So thank you. Everybody. Thank, thank you. you. So, yeah. so great thank to you, meet everyone. you all. This was so lovely to meet all of you. Thank you. So privileged. Thank everyone thank you. for coming. It's so fun to see everybody kind of working in your studios in the, in the little tiny squares. <laughs> <laughs>